I say let's get going. And if folks trickle in, they will. If they don't, they don't. Either way, we're chilling. So thank you both for being here. Um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Juliana. I use she her pronouns. I am the manager of leadership recruitment here at Matriculate, and I've worked in the recruitment and training side of things since I started here in 2019. Um, really focused on a lot of um, direct engagement with our college students, so our advising fellows and our advising fellow leaders. So HAFs, AFLT, and NAFLT, the reason we are all on this call today. Um, and you have my email here. I think I've already talked with you directly, but if you have any questions or concerns or just want to chat, please feel free to reach out to me at any point. Um, also, I have um, a Calendly that Emily's going to throw in the chat that is for like, we can just have a short um, leadership meeting. So that's an opportunity to just like connect, talk about leadership, talk about your goals, any questions that you have. Um, Leadership recruitment selection is really one of my favorite parts of the role. It's such a great opportunity to like connect with students and see them grow throughout their trajectory and their path here at Matriculate. Um, so yeah, thanks for taking the time and then I'll pop over to Emily. Hey, my name is Emily. I am a development associate at Matriculate. So I joined our full-time team in 2020, but before that I was a head advising fellow at UC Berkeley. Um, it's definitely my favorite experience I had during college, and I'm always really jazzed to talk more about it. Um, so really excited to share more and answer any questions you'll have. And my email's here too, in case you have any follow-up questions after the session. So just a little overview of how we're going to structure this session today. I'm going to start with a role overview of just what the head advising fellow position is. Then I'm going to talk about the application process. Then you'll have a chance to connect with Emily directly, ask any questions that you have. She's really a great resource. I've never served as a head advising fellow. Um, so she really is a wonderful person to ask your questions about what the day to day looks like, what balancing the role with an undergraduate workload looks like, all that type of stuff. Um, I also encourage you to reach out to the head advising fellows at your own fellowship, which who are a really great resource um, and can really share that like detailed perspective. And then we'll just do a wrap up and give time for any questions that you have. But as I said before, feel free to interrupt me and ask questions throughout. So first, let's chat about application and onboarding. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the application process. So first, we have our eligibility form. In order to be eligible for um, leadership with Matriculate, you need to be on campus and currently enrolled as an undergraduate. So a current freshman, sophomore, or junior. Um, you also need to be a certified advising fellow in good standing. The exception to that is um, obviously at our new partners. If we're starting our first fellowship in the fall, there aren't any advising fellows at those schools. So if you're coming to a new partnership, that's fine. Of course, we wouldn't expect you to be an advising fellow already. And then also we are only able to um, compensate folks with our stipended positions um, if they are able to be legally paid in the United States. So for any of our international students, if you have questions about like your unique situation, your visa, or just, um, you know, your, your position, please just send me an email and we can talk about that on a more individual basis. Um, and then for our head advising fellows, we ask that all of our leadership candidates are on campus for the duration of the first year of their role. So if you're planning to go abroad in fall of 2022 or spring of 2023, that's gonna conflict. So then after you fill out your eligibility, then we have the application. And this consists of four to six short answer questions. It depends on what position you're applying for, the number of questions there are. Um, but they're centered on the three types of skills we look for in these roles, which are leadership skills, organizational skills, and interpersonal skills. Um, and one thing I really like to highlight is that we use a universal application for our leadership roles. So hopefully that reduces um, one of the barriers in this process. So if you're interested in multiple roles, you don't have to fill out multiple applications. You can just indicate which roles you're interested in. And if you have a priority, you can rank. So let's say I'm most interested in AFLT, but I also want to apply to HAF. I can just put that on my app, send it in. Then the last part of the application is a performance task. So these are more situation-based questions. Um, well, there'll be a common scenario for the role that you're applying for. I wanna emphasize that there is not like a singular correct answer we're looking for. You know, it's not like a prescriptive rubric or anything like that. 
It's really an opportunity to demonstrate how you approach problem solving and also for you to see, oh, this is the type of challenge I might face in the role. And for you to reflect on, is this the type of challenge that I'm interested in? Does this align with like my, my values, my skill set, my goals? So then the application and performance task are on that same document. You send that in, then your application will be reviewed. And if you move forward in the process, you'll be asked to interview. So you're, you'll have an interview with your fellowship lead, which is the matriculate staff member assigned to your campus. And then you may have a second interview. Um, that doesn't happen in all cases, but if you get a second interview, that's nothing to worry about. It really depends on um, a lot of different factors. Like for example, some years we'll have like a really competitive pool at a campus. Um, so it's really challenging to determine. So we may wanna do some second interviews with some candidates, just as an example. Um, and in the interview, again, it's really an opportunity just for you to expand on your application questions. In all of the aspects of the application, I would just emphasize specificity as an application tip, just to really think about like particular examples um, and ways that you can really show who you are. That sounds a little bit cliche and trite, but it really is true. We're not looking for like a particular pre-existing leadership experience, a particular type of college application process. We're really looking for students that can just self-reflect on who they are and share that and leverage that to be an effective leader. So I really try to emphasize that. Um, any questions about the application process itself? Cool. I just had a question. I didn't get the audio on that. Would you mind just typing your question in the chat? When do candidates hear back about the interview? Great question. So. It will be around two weeks from the time that you submit your application. Um, but it also is on a rolling basis. So we're, we have our priority deadline this Sunday, um, and then we'll probably continue to accept applications on a rolling basis, depending on what the pool looks like at each campus. But I would say approximately two weeks from when you submit your application in general. Great question. So now we're going to talk a little bit about what skills we're looking for in our leaders. So these are the leadership skills that we have on our rubric that we use when evaluating your application and your interview. These are also the skills that we try to build into our training process and curriculum for our leaders. So it's not just something that we're looking for now and then we don't address again. Ideally, these are going to be some of the really foundational aspects of your matriculate leadership experience overall. I have up here an emphasis on growth and skill potential. I think this is one of the most common and unfortunate barriers to leadership that we face um, from students, especially first years um, or first year advising fellows, that they feel like they don't have experience, let's say, managing other people or they're not super confident in their ability to prioritize different competing projects, that's totally fine. One of my favorite, favorite parts of this job is working with head advising fellows over two years and seeing them really grow a lot. So if you have like a foundation and a passion to grow these skills, um, that is really what we're looking for. So I really will probably, <laughs> emphasize that an unnecessary amount of times throughout the hour that we're together, but I really want to highlight that because um, I would hate to see students count themselves out because they haven't had access to certain experiences or don't feel confident in one of these skills. Emily, do you have anything to add here? I feel like as somebody who really worked on building these skills. Yeah, it's a great question. I feel like the example that I like to go back to was when, from my own advising fellow interview back in the day. I was asked about a challenge I'd faced in the past professionally and how I addressed the problem and the steps that I took to think through the solution. 
And I remember on the spot, the main one I could think of was mediating conflicts on the playground when I was helping out in a place, a preschool classroom. And it wasn't necessarily like a list through of my resume and a lot of like professional experience that I necessarily had in the past. But the HAF interviewing me was really genuinely excited to hear about how passionate I was about early childhood education. So you can really talk about anything in your interview that you care a lot about and are passionate about when you're asked about your past experiences. So I would say, Juliana, I want to emphasize the same thing. Um, it doesn't matter really, you know, how much experience you feel you have in like the specific matriculate leadership context. We're really interested mostly in how you think about the things that you care about. Um, and your potential to grow and your ability to reflect. Hope that helps. Thanks, Emily. That's super helpful. Any questions about these skills before we move on? Yeah, I had a question. So I know when we were interviewing like AFs, we had like a list of things that we were looking for in their interviews to seeing if like they're able to hit all those marks. I was wondering if there's a similar like rubric or something that um, campus leads use to evaluate the leaders that they're interviewing? Yeah, that's a great question, Lele. Um, so these are the skills, like these are the skills that your campus leads will be looking at. Um, and in each question, we definitely don't look for all of these skills. That would be probably a bit too exhaustive, but throughout the scope of your application and interview process, we're really looking holistically to see that these three categories are all kind of met and addressed. And similar to the way we would train um, a, an, an advising fellow interviewer, um, we also make sure that matriculate staff, let's say they, they haven't seen an example of communication from you so far, they're not just gonna assume that's because you don't have strong communication skills. That will be their sign to like, ask a follow-up question or get more information. So we really try to make sure we're giving people an opportunity to show all of these skills throughout that process. Cool, thank you. Yeah, of course. So now let's talk a bit about the role. I'm gonna focus primarily on the first year of the head advising fellow role. Um, at this point though, it is a two year position. So year one in the fall and the summer, you have the recruitment and selection of advising fellows and the management of your advising fellow leadership team. Um, and in the summer months, starting with some asynchronous sessions in July and then some live sessions in August, you'll have a really robust training weekend with an opportunity to really build upon your skills and get to know leaders across all of our fellowships. Um, I think for all of our staff who attend, it's one of the highlights of our year. When I was at matriculate, it was actually my first day was HIF training, if you can believe it. So it was a lot, but it was a great way to enter the matriculate community. Um, so then recruitment takes us throughout the fall. Then in the spring is when you have your cohort selected. So that's always a really exciting moment. You've sent your offers to your incoming advising fellows. You've probably planned some really fun um, community building activities. Then you start preparing your advising fellows to get paired with their high schoolers. And then you really are, a lot of the spring is um, focused on like overseeing those relationships, getting those relationships going and supporting your students to really make that transition to working with their high schoolers. Then in the summer, um, there is a bit less of a time commitment in the summer to give everybody a break, to focus on other things, but you'll continue maintaining your relationships with your AFs and HSFs throughout that time. Then in the fall, this is a big moment as you are, I'm sure, very aware of with um, preparing your advising fellows to support their students on completing their applications, completing their financial aid. There's also um, gonna be some mentorship between you and the new head advising fellow coming in. So we always are running two cohorts simultaneously. So as a second year HAF, you'll also be supporting on recruitment of new advising fellows and sharing some of your like best practices and tips with an incoming HAF. And then in the spring, we have our college decisions, our enrollment and our transitions away from our direct support as, for, of our high schoolers as they get prepared to matriculate to college. Um, and then also some really nice opportunities to have a final celebration. 
So this is a really macro scale overview. I can send out um, the HAF position description, which you should have access to already. That goes into a lot more depth. Um, Emily, do you have anything to add here that you feel like wasn't reflected or any just kind of comments about this overview? I think you get to this on the second slide, but just wanna emphasize that in each of these seasons, you really get a lot of extensive support from staff and from your fellow head advising fellows across the country. And for me, like the training that Julieta mentioned was one of the highlights of college. I still keep in touch with a lot of head advising fellows at other colleges who are serving uh, terms when I was. So it's really a special social experience too. Any questions about this timeline? Cool. So now training. We don't just expect you to know how to do all of those things off the top of your head by no means. So we first have this summer training that Emily and I already spoke about. So this is an opportunity to come together across all of our 16 partner schools as HAFs, AFLT, and NAFLT. We also have the two class years coming together. So for your class as new head advising fellows, you'll also have an opportunity to build relationships with those senior HAFs and have that kind of um, peer mentorship among the leaders, which is awesome. Um, hopefully this year we'll have the opportunity to have an in-person training retreat. We're of course, you know, keeping our eyes on COVID as it continues to kind of evolve and change, but hopefully this is the first year in the past three years that that may be a likely possibility. So fingers crossed. Um, but if it's virtual, I think our past two years have been really effective. Um, and I feel confident that it will be a great program no matter, no matter how we slice it. So then we have spring training. There's an additional head advising fellow training um, focused on how do we transition from recruitment to advising fellow management. And then there is summer training so that you'll go through that same summer training weekend again, this time as a senior HAF, which I think is a really nice full circle moment for folks to come in like confident, knowing the role and being able to like support others who maybe are feeling more nervous and unsure. And then throughout you have monthly calls with your other head advising fellows. As Emily said, it's really great to see people like make not only like professional connections and support, but just like friendships and really good buddies with other HAFs. Um, it's so nice to see that like people are still in touch with each other and just, you know, you get a chance to meet students from all across the country. It's really awesome. Um, and then there's also, you'll always have a staff support person that you can reach out to throughout your time. Any questions about this or Emily, anything to add from your own experience? Was there anything that you felt particularly helpful about training or anything you were really nervous about going into training? I feel like the number one most helpful attitude you can bring to training is just not feeling afraid to talk about things that are challenging or nerve wracking or scary for you because a lot of head advising fellows will feel the same. And I think what was really useful for me to learn is that talking about ideas that don't work is also a really valuable tool. Like nobody's expecting you to come to these ongoing calls or to training with like an airtight vision of how everything will go. No one's expecting that advising fellows will always be on the ball and engaged. There's going to be challenge points, but it's a really special opportunity to like build a HAF community where people are comfortable talking about tricky things. So that's something that I really appreciated. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Any questions? Sweet. So now I'm going to talk a little bit more about the collaboration and resources that we have. So as a head advising fellow, you'll have one-on-one -on -one weekly meetings. So these will be with a member of matriculate staff. It'll be a different staff member depending on what point you're at in your HAF journey, so to speak. But throughout, that means you'll have like a virtual meeting on a weekly basis to talk about progress, what's going on on your campus, what challenges you're facing, also to give feedback to matriculate staff. I know we say this a lot, but it really is true that student feedback is one of the most essential elements of our program. So let's say there's a resource that you really need that you don't have access to, or you need support on, um, you know, morale and burnout on campus, or, you know, a challenging issue that some of your students are facing, you are going to have the opportunity to give feedback to matriculate staff. Then, as I mentioned before, we have all HAF calls and communication channels, so opportunities to both just like get to know people, but also um, collaborate across campuses, which is really cool. 
also challenging situations this is very broad but we just like to put that in to say that like if there are extenuating circumstances you're dealing with in your life or things that um are being faced by high school fellows or advising fellows you're never expected to deal with that alone we have um you know policies in place um emergency contacts in place this is rare that these situations happen but if they do we don't just expect you to handle them at all um, that's what we're here to support you with. Then content and resource help. So we have a really extensive curriculum. We have lots and lots of resources for our leaders, lots of professional development resources. Um, also, as a head advising fellow, you have the opportunity for innovation. So it's really cool to see the ways that each campus kind of puts their own spin on the role um, and may bring new, new things to what the idea of a matriculate leader is. And then lastly, professional development. So we're always here to write references or letters of rec to talk to you about, you know, summer opportunities, what you might want to do after college, things related to matriculate in terms of like going to college access conferences, um, speaking with our board, things like that, but also things that are totally outside of matriculate. Um, I've written a lot of med school recommendations this year, which is always something I love doing. So, you know, any way we can support our students. Any questions here? Great. So I'm not going to go okay, into. Well, the... I kind of um, didn't get a chance to ask this. Um, yeah. In terms of the. I don't know if this is a me problem, so I'm so sorry for asking again. But Emily, did you catch that audio? I didn't. I think what was helpful last time is typing it in the chat. So maybe we can try that again. Yeah, great. Thank you. Sorry about that, Swara. So in the meantime, Juliana, the question is, when is the advising fellow retreat usually held? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's usually held the, around the first weekend of August. Um, so it's, we don't have the exact dates right this summer, but we usually have our pre-recorded sessions, our asynchronous sessions throughout July, and then we have that live session um, in August. Great question. So now I'm gonna talk about um, the shared responsibilities among our different leadership roles. So I'm not gonna go as I said, it's super in depth on this. My main point is just to show that regardless of the particular leadership role you may be most interested in or choose to apply for, all of our leaders have um, kind of collaborative goals and intermingling goals throughout their positions and their time as leaders. So we have our shared goals across all of our positions in the fall of recruiting a quality and diverse class of advising fellows. Then in the winter, you're all working together to support advising fellows to persist throughout training, to get to know each other and to start building that matriculate community. And then in the spring, um, you're really focused on certification, recruiting a new class of leaders, and then supporting those advising fellows throughout their pairing with their high school students. So though there are defined differences among the three roles, you're all working as a team, we're all working as a national team. I'll give a second to just read over this slide because there's a lot of a lot of content. Um, and if you have any questions, just just let us know. Great. So I have certainly talked enough. Now we're going to have an opportunity to talk to Emily herself about her leadership experience as a head advising fellow. I have some guiding questions that we can use, um, but really I'd love to hear from our participants about what questions you have. Really um, don't hesitate. You can feel free to unmute or use the chat about what's it like to be a head advising fellow? What was the application process like? What was training like? What was the worst part? How did you balance it with school and being a student and having fun? and um, any of that type of stuff. And if you don't have immediate burning questions coming to mind, I can jump in with some of the ones that we have. Um, but I'd love to hear first and foremost what, what's on your mind. 
Um, yeah, so I'm just more interested also in like how you balance school with maybe other involvements as well as being HAF because it does seem like a big commitment. Yeah, that's a really great question. So for reference, when I was in college, I was involved in a number of orgs on campus. So I was a matriculate HAF and I also was really into Korean traditional drumming and we had rehearsals at late nights on most days of the week. So for me, what was really helpful was really leaning into my co-head advising fellow. So I had a really great peer HAF at Berkeley named Elaine. And every week we would carve out time to not just divvy up tasks together, but honestly, either like meet up on campus or on Zoom and really talk through a lot of the challenges or upcoming milestones that our cohort was facing. And I think just building out those moments of solidarity week to week, it is technically like, you know, 30 minutes or an hour of your time, but it alleviates so many hours of you just sitting by yourself feeling stressed about the HAF position. So that was something really helpful for me. Um, I'll also add that every week I had a check-in with the fellowship lead. So this is a member, as Juliana said, um, of Matriculate's full-time staff. That's another really great moment to, first of all, talk about challenges you're experiencing, but also make work time. So while you're talking with your fellowship lead, you can also like do tasks together. Um, you can share your screen and walk through the logic of, you know, what the upcoming meeting will look like and what you're hoping to share with advising fellows. So, all that to say, there's lots of moments where you can really work as a team and leverage those group calls uh, to make the commitment seem less arduous. Yeah, hope that helps. And yeah, sorry, I was also just wondering how you were able to like motivate the advising fellow leadership team to be committed, because sometimes it might be hard if like they're also like I, from my experience, like not with matriculate, but with some other clubs, it might be like hard to get members to be very motivated in doing certain tasks. So I was just wondering how you approach that. Yeah, I, I think that something really important to keep in mind, right, is that no matter how much experience you have with matriculate, I think the second step is there's a reason you joined and there's also a reason why you joined at your campus. So matriculate at UC Berkeley like didn't exist in a vacuum. We had a bunch of other educational organizations on campus, but for me, it felt really special to have national um, impact and to have this model that was so clearly like virtual, but also intensive and personally tailored to each high school student. And I think insofar as you can remind the AFLT about why they not only join matriculate more generally, but why they feel it's so important for matriculate to be on your campus, I think it's a really powerful tool to keep engagement going. And I would say the same goes for like advising fellows generally, right? Like it's not just about like matriculate is a great org, but like why is matriculate great at Tufts or why is it great to have at Stanford? Um, so getting really specific can kind of be encouraging for folks. Thank oh, you. I see a question in the chat also. Yeah, thanks Lily, that was a really good question. My campus will have its first fellowship launching this fall. Can you please share some challenges from the recruitment process and what you feel helped motivate students not previously engaged with matriculate to join? Yes, I feel like Berkeley is a really good case study of this because it's a massive school with like 30,000 undergrads. And there were a lot of days that felt really discouraging of tabling out on our main plaza where a bunch of people will just pass you by and not take your flyers. Um, so that's answering the first part of the question, right? The challenges, sometimes it feels really demotivating to care about the work so much um, and to feel like there's really a lot of room for a matriculate to grow at your campus, but not see that enthusiasm right away. I would say what really felt like it helped, what really helped to motivate students not involved with matriculate get involved um, was asking really directly, like what was your college application experience like? Because more often than not, even if folks were fortunate and had a lot of support, people find it like a really challenging time in their life. People will talk about like how hard it was to write essays, how they felt like they really had to impress colleges and they sacrificed some of their personal identity. Um, and I think that once you get folks thinking about that, they start to think, huh, like it would be really cool to be that person for someone else. Um, I think that's like one of the most powerful methods of recruitment and Julianne is also an expert on this. So also welcome you to chime in here too, Jules, and see if you have anything to add. Yeah, that's super, um, super great approach, Emily. I love that question too. Because whether people had like a positive experience or a more challenging one, people have opinions about their college application process. I feel like it can really spark good conversation. 
Um, but in in terms of recruitment overall, um, there are def there's definitely a lot of collaboration across campuses throughout recruitment um, because it is challenging, you know, depending on what point you're at in the semester, especially in the past two years, there's been a lot of challenges with, you know, okay, we're not able to reach students on campus. How do we develop more, you know, social media content? How do we reach out to students one on one? How do we have community building events that feel fun and not just, you know, like an awkward meeting online that people don't feel engaged in? So there's a lot of collaboration in those like monthly HAF calls, um, in our Slack channels. We also have a weekly recruitment newsletter that we send out. And so throughout that, we'll like highlight, oh, here's a really cool thing that happened at UPenn. They had this great event. Here's their slide deck that they used. Um, feel free to make your own version. And we'll also, in addition to showing um, like successes of the week, we'll also say like, hey, a lot of students have told us they're having a really hard time um, building connections with other organizations. So here's some troubleshooting tips. So we definitely try to like crowdsource during recruitment and share ideas across campuses as much as possible. Um, but that's a great question. Any other thoughts, questions, ideas? I'll go to this other slide just to see if um, this sparks any ideas, but I'd love to hear if either of you have any more questions. And I wanna add too, the questions you've asked already are great. And if you have any fuzzy ones in your brain that you're just not sure how to phrase yet, like feel free to throw them out there and they can be as like specific or non-specific as you want. I can jump in here with yeah, a question. I have two things that I would kind of love to hear from you. One is just, um, what are some skills, like specific skills that you feel like you had to lean on or develop to be successful as a head advising fellow? Mm -hmm. And also I'd love to hear if there's anything you know now, having been through the entirety of the role and then some, um, is there anything you know now that you would kind of give as uh, advice to first time applicants, new applicants? Yeah both really great. Um, on skills, it's kind of weird and meta. I think that as a head advising fellow, on one hand, you're like still an advising fellow, right? You're serving high school fellows yourself, but you're, you're also serving as sort of like a witness to all these other relationships happening within your cohort. You're trying to liaise between advising fellows and making sure it's a comfortable community space for undergraduates, but you're also kind of relationship guru. Like people will come up to you with questions on like, my high school fellow isn't responding to me or they're feeling really sad about this part of the college application process. How can I encourage them? Um, so that was kind of a useful skill to both one, leverage my own personal experience, but I think two, as a source of support, maintain the fact that like everyone has a different experience, right? And so really leaning on matriculate central curriculum and not bringing like preconceived biases to whatever approach I took to supporting an advising fellow. That was a really useful skill. I'll also say that it challenged me to, think, I hate using like the term like thinking like consultant because I feel like lots of industries are really good at this, but really articulating like, what are the challenges that we're facing? What are the limits? So sometimes it might be capacity, like your team is feeling really strained. And then what are the solutions that account for the um, capacity strains that you're experiencing? I've never been in another leadership position where like staff and peers were challenging me to think that step by step about what we were um, doing that year or how we were planning to grow. So I think like taking things one at a time is another thing I got a lot better at as an HAF. In terms of how I would advise uh, new applicants or people who are new to matriculate in general and considering uh, leadership. Yeah, like I said earlier, think about how matriculate fits into the overall ecosystem of your campus and why you think it's so important for us to have a presence there and why you think you could bring like a really good perspective to that presence on your campus. Um, I'd also say like, have fun, bring your whole, whole personality to the interview and your application process. Like, I know it's really easy to think of these leadership applications as places where you have to have a really clean resume. And like, it's good to have a clean resume, but we also wanna see like places where you shine, where you talk in ways that feel really organic to you and you don't feel like you're just filling in silence. Like talk about things that make you excited. Um, I feel like that's advice I would give to anyone overall in any position, but yeah. Uh, I see other things coming up in the chat. Um, yeah, so Sora, I think I already left, but thank you to Sora for joining. And I think Marcus is here too. 
I will put this in here. And in terms of the point that um, Emily just made, I'd also say like, not only are we interviewing you, but like you're interviewing matriculate, you know, throughout yeah. your application process, like you're interviewing the HRF role as a concept or the AFLT role to figure out like, is this aligned with my goals? Is this aligned with my values? Is this the way that I want to spend like eight to 10 hours a week for the next two years of my life? So don't hesitate to ask those questions in your interview and your application. Um, I love a hard question. Like when I'm the interviewer and someone asks me a hard question, I love that. It shows me they're really like thinking deeply about the role. Um, and in my role managing recruitment, I never want to have students feel, my goal is not for students to join necessarily. My goal is for students to have all the information they need to make the decision that's right for them. Um, I also want to say hello to Marcus for joining. We had some folks who left. We're just wrapping up our Q&A with Emily, but we recorded the info session so I can send you the beginning part that you missed. Um, so lastly, I just want to see if anybody has any remaining questions um, or if you like ha have something on the application process you're struggling with. Um, and other than that, we can throw the link to the application itself in the session in the in the chat. Um, we do have our deadline coming up this Sunday at midnight. That is a priority deadline. So I know a lot of students do have like midterms right now. So if you have something that's going to make meeting that timeline challenging, that's fine. Shoot me an email. We can make it work. If you need an extension, that's totally doable. Um, any any other questions, things you want to ask? Um, yeah, I was just wondering if, Emily, you've been in a position that's like not like with matriculate that's not HAF, like while you were still in undergrad, maybe like AFLT or NAFLT and how that differed in terms of like what you do on a day-to-day -day basis compared to HAF. Yeah, so I did not have any real like material matriculate leadership positions before I joined on as an HAF. I was an advising fellow for one and a half years by the time that I applied. Um, I was sort of informally I wouldn't even call it a leadership position, but we had working group meetings every month as AFs. And usually in my group, I would serve as like the informal leader and guide the discussions. And I would say that experience was really helpful. So it's never too early to start like flexing those HAF skills. Like if you're an advising fellow, it can be as easy as like being engaged in the community Slack or Discord or whatever platform you use. Um, and I think just having visibility into other AF relationships and making friends with other AFs really set me up for success in the HAF role. Um, but yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, and Lele, if you have interest in, I know you have people on your campus you can talk to and your own experiences, but if you want to be connected directly to like an NAFLT member or something, um, just let me know and I'm sure they'd be more than happy to chat with you. Okay, cool. Cool. So as I said, we have our deadline coming up on March 27th, flexible deadline. Um, I'll put my email in the chat again. If people have questions, you can also feel free to stay on at the end. Um, and then after the application, again, you'll hear back in about two weeks if you're selected for an interview. Um, and the leadership training process will begin in July. But I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, I really hope to see your application. Um, and I'm just super excited to kind of start working with this new class of leaders. Um, and if you have any concerns throughout the weekend or next week, just let us know. We'd be more than happy to support you in any way that we can. And feel free to stay on to ask any more questions. If I could add like one more tip that I think is really helpful for AJF, but honestly, like any job or position that you interview for, like Juliana said, like you're also interviewing us. Like ask about the history of the HAF role and how it's changed and how it's changed at your campus. Like you can ask your interviewer, what are some things that have worked in the past? Um, how do you see the vision of matriculate on this campus changing over the next few years? And as an applicant, you might have an answer to that, right? Like what your perspective is. But I've always figured that like having a wealth of knowledge about the history of matriculate at your campus is really helpful as you think about where you'd like to take the community as a leader. Um, and I think the same applies for other jobs too. It's always helpful to get that context. Yeah. And the HAFs on your campuses are like a profound resource too. So 
definitely, I'm sure you may have already spoken with them, but connect with them and get their get their take on the role and their experience. Okay, thank you so much for your time, Juliana and Emily. Thank um, you. Thanks, Larry. Thanks for bringing so many good questions. Take care. Bye. All right, I've got. Uh, sorry to keep you over, but just one oh, like no, quick question. So I guess just like because um, I'm going to be starting the advising fellow role very soon, and I'm very excited to do so. Um, my campus is going to start like pairing us up with our with our high school fellows very soon. So that's an exciting exciting process for sure. But I guess just a question for this is probably more for Emily, but um, I guess. It, like in, I guess my question is in in what ways have you been able? Do you think to like impact your matriculate like fellowship in your HAF role more so than you could in your mm. just normal advising fellow role? Like yes. what opportunities and what like what options have you had to be able to like make that greater impact? I think this might be my favorite question I've ever been asked about the HAF role. Um, Number one, immediately, you're kind of an ambassador, like the identity of matriculate at your campus, whereas advising fellows are really focused on their relationship with their high school students and they lean on each other for advice. As a head advising fellow, you're seeing all of that at scale and you're condensing all of those experiences into informing what kinds of social events you have, for example, in matriculate at your campus. Are those social events going to be more geared towards like doing things that really relate to work with your high school students? Is it like writing your high school students postcards um, or is it more focused on the advising fellow social experience? I think there's like so many ways as a head advising fellow that you really get to dig into like what matriculate looks like at UC Berkeley. Um, and not only that, but as a head advising fellow, you're really laying the foundation for matriculate nationally, not just at your school. So by virtue of being part of this nationwide leadership network, you're also informing the staff about what programmatic elements are working. You can talk about what elements of the curriculum can be clarified. You can talk about whether working groups are working at your campus or whether there's other ways that advising fellows have engaged that maybe we can replicate at other campuses. Like going from HAF to a staff member now, I can't emphasize enough like how powerful the HAF voice is in shaping how the organization grows and how we shape our model over the years. So those are my two immediate responses, but I'm happy to think about this more because I really like this question. Um, is there like a follow up there or other things that you're thinking about, Marcus? Um, I guess, I guess just like, um, what are what are some of like the biggest challenges that you've had to face as an HAF? Just like, just going into that, and you know, what sorts of skills did you need to apply to to really get through them and make sure that your fellowship like stayed on the right track? Yeah, I think that one challenge that's maybe common among college organizations is just the fact that everyone's busy. Like everyone has mm -hmm. a lot of classes, everyone has midterms at different times. Um, and sometimes it's tough, especially I think in the fall and winter to keep folks really engaged and on the ball when it comes to submitting deliverables like session summaries, for example. Um, so that can feel kind of discouraging, honestly. Um, but skills that you can bring to sort of address those are, you know, being, being tenacious is a big word, but like implementing that in little ways, right? Like identifying when you feel tired and when you might need to lean into your co-head advising fellow or a staff member. Like having that emotional intelligence to know when you feel overwhelmed is really important and voicing that when it happens. Um, I would say also, I think a lot of advising fellows are naturally really good about this because we do it with our high school students too. But when someone's not delivering the way you feel that maybe they should or that they think they should, like having a conversation rather than just like a direct top to bottom, like you need to be doing this, like opening spaces where people can talk about challenges they're experiencing within matriculate and outside of it. I think that was a really sp special position to be in as HAF. Um, yeah, that's the biggest challenge. I think recruitment is also kind of a tough time generally. I mean, it can feel like there's a lot of pressure to like recruit folks to join matriculate at your campus, but I think staff tends to be really supportive and we're very aware that it's challenging. I think that's the biggest thing is like staff knows that it's hard um, and that's informed. Or like we will use that to inform our check-ins with you, if that makes sense. I think you're muted, Marcus. 
No, yeah, that definitely makes sense. Uh, so thank you. No, yeah, because I definitely feel I definitely feel for something like recruitment, like you really want to emphasize the fact that like this is something meaningful. Like this is not something that's taking away from your time, but is like enhancing your time at like as part of your college experience. Mm -hmm. It's like while going through the application and stuff, like there's there's one question where it's like you know, how would you deal with low attendance or how would you, you know, push during recruitment that this is something important. And just like, as the more I thought about that was that like, people can sometimes see organizations as like taking away from the time that they would use to like study and learn and, you know, do other things. But I guess if you can find a way to like frame the organization in a way where it's not taking away time, but is very much worth your time, mm -hmm. then you know, then, then things could get better. And I think it's just a matter of like, how can you really accomplish that? You know? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's so well said. And I, I think a huge part of being a leader with matriculate and especially like bringing new people into the community is just like sharing that passion. Um, and I think people really respond to that students, just like sharing what matriculate means to them. And also there's such a diverse set of reasons why people join matriculate um, and everyone's path is different. Everyone's motivation is different. That's one of my favorite things. Mm -hmm. We have students like across disciplines, students who had very different college application processes themselves. Um, so I think like whatever your story may be, sharing that is just something that I think always like really resonates and is, you know, authentic. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm really glad that you mentioned that um, here, Marcus, and I hope that people watching this recording also hear that because that's something that a lot of HAF candidates have questions about, like, is this going to take up a lot of time? And I think your perspective is a really good one. All right. Thank you. Um, I think that's it for my questions for now. But if I have any more, I'll definitely, definitely shoot an email. But I appreciate you doing this. And um, I'll take a look at the recording for the earlier part of the, oh. of the session, but I appreciate your time. Sweet. Thanks, Marcus. All right. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.